Brothers and sisters, it's a pleasure for me to join you this morning in this little meeting. I hope that we can make it worth our time to be here. I will focus our attention this morning on Arabia. Maybe we should do it like when you say Moses. Moses. Uh, Arabia. I've, I've put this small map up here on the board to give you an idea of where things are. Let me just orient you very briefly. This is where Jerusalem lies, up here. This is the approximate place of the first camp of Lehi and Sariah. This is the approximate place where Nahum lies. As you remember, that's the place, the burial place of Ishmael. This is about the place where they came out on the seacoast over in southern Oman. Well, I'll give you reasons why I think that it's southern Oman a little bit later on. The journey from the upper left to the lower right is more than 2,100 miles. I'll just give you an idea of scale uh, of what we're, what we're talking about today. Whenever students come to me who are interested in the ancient world, they want to work with New Testament studies or Old Testament studies or classics or something, I say, think Arabia. There are literally tens of thousands of inscriptions on temples that are still preserved in, in, in uh, southern Arabia that nobody's read. Um, I mean, it's the people, people who, do, uh, who, who work archaeologically in places like Turkey and Israel would, would uh, almost kill just for a couple of small ones. And these guys have hundreds and hundreds of lines. Let me, let me read a couple of paragraphs to sort of introduce us to, to what we want to do with today. Nudged firmly by the Lord, Lehi and Sariah led their extended family out of Jerusalem and into the desert of Arabia, beginning an exodus that would be celebrated in story and song for a thousand years. Until the translation of the Book of Mormon, their saga would not be known to the wider world for more than two and a half millennia. While spending months, perhaps years, at a base camp near the northeastern arm of the Red Sea, the family kept contact with their estate at Jerusalem through the four sons, Laman, Lemuel, Sam, and Nephi. Twice these sons had to go back the more than 200 miles to the city at the behest of the Lord. It's more like about 260, 270 miles. The first time they went back to obtain a scriptural record inscribed on plates of brass, and the second time to persuade another family that of a man named Ishmael, to join them at the camp in their quest for a promised land. But after the Lord directed the party to move deeper into the desert, they packed up their tents and provisions and crossed the river Laman, never to return again to Jerusalem, effectively cutting themselves off from hearth and home. A person might ask the question, why pay attention to this family trekking into the desert of Arabia? There are three reasons. First, it is evident from the Book of Mormon text that the descendants of this family referred back to this desert saga again and again. It was a chief point of reference in their long history, which in large measure defined how they saw themselves and how they saw others. As an example, for centuries the descendants of the older brothers Laman and Lemuel held the belief that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers, probably meaning Lehi and Nephi, and that they were wronged in the wilderness, here Arabia, by their brethren, to include Nephi and Sam. And they were also wronged while crossing the sea. It's all out of Messiah chapter 10, verse 12. The second reason has to do with the narrative of 1 Nephi. While it is spare in its detail, Nephi has written enough that we can actually track in general terms where the family traveled and where important events occurred. There's a third reason. It concerns clues within the text that shed light on this journey of journeys. We notice here that it was not a journey that mirrors circumstances in upstate New York, where Joseph Smith was living when he began to translate the Book of Mormon. It was a journey that ran across one of the harshest climbs on the surface of the earth. Okay, having said that much, let's, 
uh, let's make a couple of notations. There are very few specific geographical connections that we can make in the book of 1 Nephi to real terrain. One of those, of course, is Jerusalem. Another one is the Red Sea. A third one would be the Indian Ocean, what these people call Irientum. Um, and uh, Joseph Smith elsewhere calls it the Great Sea, uh, or the Great Ocean uh, on the south. And also I think we can say pretty much where Bountiful lies, because there's only one stretch of land along the whole south coast of Arabia, south coast meaning meaning the one that stretches from um, southwest to northeast. So, the, the, along the south coast of Arabia, there's only one place that fits Nephi's description of the botany of the area, which would include wild honey, a lot of fruit, and timbers. And that lies right along in this, in this area here. There's a, there's, a, there's a maritime plain, a plain that runs right along the seacoast, about 100 miles long, between 2 and 20 miles deep. Uh, and so on, which every summer during the monsoon rains becomes like a Garden of Eden. And uh, even in the dry season, which is the time of year that I visited there, there are things that are still blooming and ripening so that it would, there would be a constant source uh, of food. Besides, the whole Indian Ocean is out there. A lot of fish. <clears throat> okay. At the moment, I'm the uh, sort of over, overall coordinator, director of a series of projects at the end of Lehigh's Trail. Um, there are botanists who have been, who've gone into the field in southern Oman. Our geologists have been there. Uh, we're waiting on a, on a permit to, uh, to begin archaeological work. We think we'll be able to begin that a little more than a year from now. And also, Brother Woodward, who was here yesterday, is, uh, is leading a team of people who have begun a series of DNA studies in that part of the world to determine tribal connections and uh, tribal histories more clearly. It, our intent of sending botanists into the field and geologists and so on is to learn more about the world into which Lehi and Sarai emerged when they came out of the desert. You remember that they'd been in the desert for eight years. And it's almost as though you can hear them singing as they crest that final hill and they see this green carpet stretching all the way to the Blue Sea. That's exactly what Bertram Thomas described when he made the trip by Camelback from Muscat to, to this area in the south. And as he came up over the, over the top, he could see this carpet of green trees and bushes and so on stretching before him. To, uh, to the blue of the sea. Now, there are, there are evidences that have the largely are circumstantial, which have begun to give us a picture of what it was like for them to travel in, uh, uh, in this part of the world, them meaning Lehi, Sariah, and other members of their party. There, some of you are aware that uh, in the early 50s, Brother Nibley published uh, a work on Lehi. And he, he made some astute observations, one of which was that uh, the first camp must have lain somewhere north of the Straits of Tehran. The Straits of Tehran are the place where, where, the, uh, where Arabia and the Sinai Peninsula come close together just as one enters what's called the Gulf of Aqaba or the Gulf of Eilat, whether you're talking to a Jordanian or whether you're talking to an Israeli, they name it differently. But uh, the Gulf here, uh, this little spit of water that stretches up through here, dividing Arabia on this side and the Sinai on the other, the Straits of Turan lie here. But the Nibli also made the guess that it was this stretch of land right here in South Southeast Arabia, which was the place of Bountiful, because it's the only place that would support uh, the kind of uh, 
the kind of vegetation that Nephi describes. Okay, now, years later, 1976, Lennon Hope Hilton traveled through some of this territory, and they concluded that, um, that the best candidate for the first camp was at, a, at an oasis called al um, there, there were wells there. There was probably already a little settlement there of people, Bedouins and so on. There was enough to keep one alive. There were, there were trees. Uh, we're now talking about uh, palm trees and so on for date uh, palm trees and the like. They suggested that in a wide valley uh, in northwestern Saudi Arabia, that was the place where the family camped. It's, it lies about 75 or 80 miles south of Aqaba. It, it seems as though Nephi makes his note about the three days journey after they reach the first sighting of water. And that would be at Aqaba, the, the Jordanian port, which uh, opens onto this little, uh, this little gulf that I was just talking about, um, that they then travel three days south. Depending on the speed of their animals, they would have, they would have uh, been with pack, pack animals, because you can't carry tents, even if you undo them, better when tents you can take apart, even if they undo them, they're still very heavy. So you, you can't load them on your teenager's backs, you have to, uh, to put them on the back of a donkey or a camel. And so they're traveling, they, they go 15, 25 miles a day, and uh, this site that the Hilton suggested is within reach. More recently, uh, a fellow who lives and works in Saudi Arabia has uh, sort of stumbled into a canyon uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. He was actually looking, he, he was interested in uh, an Old Testament connection. And he was looking for a place called the Waters of Moses. Uh, there actually are a number of these places uh, in the Middle East, but, uh, but he was looking for the one in northwest Saudi Arabia. And he stopped and visited with an official in the town, uh, he and a friend, and they were sent on down the road to another town over closer to the coast. When he arrived over there, the mayor wasn't there, but the, but the police chief was, so they visited with him and he said, oh, you want to go up the coast here to, 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 uh, to a place he says, you'll see if there's a Coast Guard station, Saudi Coast Guard station, and so on. So they, they drove on this little narrow road right out on the, uh, on the coastline, which is a military road, with a permit signed by the police chief uh, to allow them to travel. And when they came to the end, they, they found a canyon whose walls rise some 2,000 feet in the air uh, sheer, sheer cliffs above them, um, found themselves in a canyon with a stream of water in northwest Arabia. Since those days, he and his friends have gone back at different times of the year. The stream still runs at all times of the year. So it's a continually running stream. That's how Nephi describes it in his narrative. Um, uh, plus, um, uh, above that, you don't you don't see where it's running, but it's it's a natural protection deep in this canyon, where where one can get out of the heat of the desert in uh, in the shade and so on. So for him, that's that's a a real possibility. He and his friends have sort of looked through all of the canyons or wadis, W A D I is how you spell that, through the wadis in that part of the world. They found no other natural uh, water sources in those areas. <clears throat> he says that the, that the water level is, is slowly going down and uh, that's because the water is being pumped uh, out of wells that, that are there that the Bedouins used to pump. Um, I'm going to make a small commercial here. Uh, we published that, that piece written by George Potter in this issue of the Journal of Book Mormon Studies. Some of you are aware of this, uh, of this journal. Uh, it's published by Farms. I'm one of the associate editors. There are several in this audience who have been contributors over a period of time. And uh, 
and we think that this is a this is a fine instrument, and we think that we publish some very good things. There's something on the possible location of, of the first camp of Lehi and Sarai in this issue, plus something else, a little piece that I published there. Included in in our in our last issue is another piece on Arabia, where a geologist uh, deals with iron ore in southern Oman. Our geologists found two big deposits there. They're not big enough to mine, uh, to exploit economically nowadays, but they certainly were enough for Lehi or for Nephi to walk over and pick up 50 pounds of, of rock, put it in the saddlebags of his donkeys, and go back to the camp and uh, and make some iron ore. So it looks to me like we've we've come quite a ways in try in identifying. The approximate place, we don't know exactly where the Heinz Rife pitched their tent, tents, plural, so there are more than one out there. Uh, but, but we think we're in the neighborhood, okay? This one canyon, it's called Wadi Taiba al Isim, the canyon of the good name, okay? Uh, that Wadi Taiba al Isim is certainly a prime candidate as a place that these people may have camped continue running the stream, and so on. Some vegetation there, too, as you might expect. Well, after the family left that first camp, they moved south, and they came to a place, the place, Nephi writes, the place which was called Nahum. Now, it's notice that it's passive, meaning that somebody else had named the place. In all the other stops, it was, it was family members who named them. It seems it was Lehi for the first time, and then when they reached Bountiful, it seems to have been a family agreement or something. But uh, uh, Lehi names the river, uh, the river Laman, the valley, the valley of Lemuel. Later on, he calls the place Shazer, and so on as they go south. But when they reach Nahum, it's a place that, that already enjoys a pre-existing name. It was, uh, it was a, a couple from Australia, brother and sister Aston, who, who began to poke around and uh, using a clue from, an, from a one-page article by Ross Christensen, who used to be, he's now, now passed away, he used to be on the faculty of, uh, of anthropology and archaeology here at BYU, in a one-page um, article once in the, in the era. And in there he said that uh, he had noticed that a German geographer had noted a place called Nehem, N-E-H-H-M. And he thought, well, maybe there's a connection with this spot in South Arabia and uh, uh, Lehi's, uh, uh, or this place called Nahum. Well, the, the Astons did a, did a bit of research they found that this name also appeared in Arabic sources, which go back to the early Islamic period, 9th and 10th centuries AD, that it's known as the place name, that it's also known as a tribal name, and that it's in a place where if you then draw a line across Arabia to, to southern Oman, it's about eastward from, from about right here, over to here. Okay, so they have pushed this thing back to the 19th century AD. The problem with that is we're still a millennium and a half distant from the time the Lehi and Sarai traveled through this area. They went through there about 600 BC. Uh, the Astons identified Arabic sources that uh, go back to about the 9th century AD. So we're still somewhat apart, okay. I've become interested in, a, in an exhibit that was in Paris. I saw a notice of it in a, in a magazine. It was an exhibit of ancient Yemen artifacts. We're hoping that in three or four years it might make it to BYU. It's now showing in Europe. I think it just opened in Spain. So um, I, I, I saw a couple of pieces that were photographed in, uh, in the article that I read. And uh, so I, I, uh, I, bought the, I bought the catalog. 
catalog arrived and I did some photography work of some altars. They're incense altars that were, that were donated to temples in Saudi Arabia. They were inscribed that, that preserved the name of the donor and father's name and the grandfather's name and the tribal name and the occasion which brought the, which brought the donation and so on. <clears throat> And I was photographing some of them. Then I decided that I'd better, because I think that the, um, uh, let me back up a little bit. I've been interested in why Nephi, uh, Lehi called the great and spacious building strange. And I've, and I've concluded in my own mind that it's because it was different architecturally from what he had seen in his own surroundings. In South Arabia, all architecture is square. There's not a circle, there's not a, an arch or anything like that. All of the doorways and all the window ways are with lintels across. There's no such thing as an arch and so on. And I suspect that, that, uh, you know, that the architecture is strange to, to his eye when he saw it. And, um, so, and I've also learned that architecture can be preserved in miniature. We know, we know something about what the Church of the Holy Sepulchre used to look like uh, because European travelers came and visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, went back and made miniatures in, in metals or in other sort of uh, media uh, to preserve what they saw. So I, I thought that, well, these little altars preserve architectural features and so I was reading the description of one of the altars that was pictured in the guide, the, the, the catalog which was traveling with his exhibit uh, then in Paris. And it said, Beathar, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, the Nehemite, N-I-H-M is the name of it, well, N-H-M is the name of his tribe. And the excavator who wrote the description dates this inscribed altar to the 7th, 6th centuries BC. Bingo. The name is contemporary with Lehi Sarai. We now know that from an independent written source. Now, in the world of archaeology, nothing is as rich and as decisive as writing, okay, you can dig up all the artifacts you want, but if you find one with a name on it or an inscription, it's, it's much better than just the artifact by itself. The inscription makes it, and it doesn't work. So, so now we find ourselves with this name, NHM, dated back to the time of Lehi and Sarai. There are actually two other altars uh, at uh, at, at the same temple where this was found, and uh, that they all, there are two other altars which also, which also exhibit the same name NHM. As, as many of you know, in Semitic languages, one doesn't write with vowels, one writes with consonants. And so NHM, that, that in fact is the name, and that's also the name of Nahon. Now the H, is problematic because in old South Arabian it was a soft H. Naham, whereas the H in Hebrew, which which Nephi preserves for us in his narrative, is probably Nachom. There's a it's a harsher or stronger H. But what you have to do is ask yourself, what did Nephi and Lehi and Sarai and the rest of the party hear? when they heard the name of the place. Well, they heard a name which they associated with a Hebrew term which was familiar to them. The Hebrew term means something quite different from the one in Old South Arabia. But the name is there. It's a personal name. It's a tribal name. It's, uh, it's a name of a place. And that's what we see in the narrative of First Nephi. This place lies uh, a few dozen kilometers north of, of the modern capital of Yemen, Sana'a. The tribe has been in its place for thousands of years. It still has the same name, um, and
And so we know that we're in the neighborhood. And we know that the name was contemporary to the Israel. Well, after I read that inscription, it sort of bore in on me what I was reading. And I was on the ceiling for the rest of the day. Uh, that was really wonderful, too, <laughs> to sort of stumble onto this name and then associate it with, uh, with first, first Nephi chapter 16 and the name which Nephi preserves for us. Now, there's another piece to this. At that point in South Arabia, all roads turn east. And that's what Nephi says as he opens chapter 17. He says, and from that time, we did travel near the eastward. Remember that? <clears throat> the main incense road, which came up out of Arabia, was coming north. I, I think I assume, and I, th and I think it's a pretty good guess, pretty good assumption, that Lehi and Sarai and their party were either traveling on the incense trail or they were shadowing it as they came south. And Nephi says, we're going south, southeast. Then he puts this other jog in the trail, going east. The, the caravans are going exactly the opposite direction. There's a major staging area, 150 miles to the east of where the Nahum, or where the Nahum tribal area is, Nahum was. And, and it was the place where all of the incense was gathered from that part of Arabia. It was unloaded from, from the animals. It was weighed, it was counted, uh, it was taxed. Uh, people had to, had to pay an obligatory um, contribution to the local temples, those kinds of things. Then it was loaded again on new camels, and off it went, going west. <clears throat> now, the, the actual trail to follow the wells bends south before it actually ends up due west of where it starts in this town, this city. But one can take shortcuts across the desert. There's a spit of the desert called Ramla to Sabatain. One can take shortcuts, but the problem is that the distance between wells is 100 miles. And uh, that's a long time to keep oneself and one's camels going. Uh, but it can be done. So the shortcuts and the main trail all are headed west. Lehi and Sarai are coming the opposite way, and they turn east. There's not an ancient source that knows this. Not one. I've looked in plenty. Um, Strabo, who was born um, a few years before Jesus was born, wrote a geography, and uh, he mentions a series of cities in this part of Arabia, and he talks about their relative uh, direction to one another, west to east. But he doesn't talk about connecting roads. And he doesn't tell us that the main incense road from the, from the tribal area of Nahum runs east. Okay. There is a spur of the trail that goes from that area where the Nahum tribe lived, goes south across the mountains and down into Aden, where the bombing of the USS Cole occurred last, uh, last October. Uh, but that's not, that's not a main part of the trail. The main part of the trail comes from the east into the Nahum tribal area and turns north. It's only known by someone who's, who's traveled this. I've looked around and I've found one map drawn by a, 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 a drawn about 1460 AD by a geographer in Germany <clears throat> that shows knowledge of a trail that comes down into Arabia and then turns east. <clears throat> this geographer, the German geographer, based his work, his, his map, on, uh, on, uh, on the written work of a man named Ptolemy, who, uh, who was born about 100 AD. Uh, Ptolemy uh, became a famous geographer and there are a number of maps that are based on his written work. It's debated whether or not he drew maps. But, uh, but I found one map that's owned by the New York Public Library, which shows this trail, which was, which was drawn about 1460 BC. But it was not available to Joseph Smith, who was still in Europe at that time. It was not acquired. 
by the New York Public Library, or the library which preceded the, uh, the New York Public Library until 1892. Uh, that's when it acquired that, uh, that particular map. But the, how do I explain this trail? It's because I think the European geographers have been talking with, with the Arab geographers who knew the turn of the trail. There's no European source, there's no classical source that, uh, that knows of this, this turn of the trail. Um, yes? You said 14 BC. Uh, 1460 BC. Uh, I'm sorry, 1460 AD. Yeah. 1460 AD is the date of this, uh, of this thing. By the way, I should say that, uh, that much of what I talk about today is going to be published in a, in a book by Farms. Brother Peterson may know more about this than I. Um, it was represented to me as Joseph Smith's greatest hits. Uh, I think Brother Tibetans is going to, uh, has something in that, meaning hits on a bullseye. And uh, I've written a piece on, uh, on ancient Arabia and uh, much of what I have, much of what I'm talking about, um, will be there. We'll be doing it tonight. Okay. <clears throat> this actually raises the question, what, what about written sources available to Joseph Smith? Uh, or maps available to Joseph Smith? Um, some of you might be aware that, uh, that Arabia and LDS interest in Arabia, myself and others, uh, has begun to draw some anti-Mormon fire. And uh, there is not an identified person who posted on the web, uh, at a website, I think it's called Zion's Lighthouse website, posted on there an attack on the notion that, uh, that Nahum, or Nehem, was a real place. Uh, not, not that it wasn't a real place, but that that Joseph Smith could not have known about it. And he pointed to two Europeans who had drawn maps. And in their maps of Arabia, they included this place name. One was Karsten Niebuhr, who, uh, who went into Arabia in the 1760s, published a couple of volumes after he returned, and those two volumes were translated into English in the 1790s. Could have been available to Joseph Smith. Another one was uh, written by a guy by the name of Jean-Baptiste Andille, a Frenchman who was a cartographer and uh, who published a book on ancient geography, which was subsequently translated into English uh, about 18, uh, 1807, something like that. It also could have been available to Joseph Smith. And this guy, an identified, suggested that Joseph Smith could have gotten access to this thing in the Dartmouth Library because the family didn't live very far from there. So I got thinking about this, and uh, yeah, Joseph Smith lived there, the family lived there for, for two years. They lived south of there in the town. Could have gotten up there as a very precocious first or second grader. I mean, that's, that's how old Joseph Smith was when his family was living. So he could have gotten to the Dartmouth Library and thumbing through some things, found these fascinating maps from uh, Dunville on one hand and from Niebuhr on the other hand, and he could have said, oh, look at this name. It's the same name in both places. Isn't that interesting? And then he remembered that and stuck it into his narrative uh, for Nephi as he, as he composed it. Well, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> with the help of a, of a woman who was a former, uh, who was a former employee of Dartmouth College and also was uh, the institute uh, teacher uh, for the students at Dartmouth. She helped me run down the acquisition dates of these works in the Dartmouth Library. One was acquired in 1821, 1822, long after Joseph Smith left, uh, moved to New York. The other one wasn't, uh, wasn't acquired until 1837, 150 years after it had been translated into English. So it was never available for Joseph Smith to consult um, plus, it was bad. It was bad form on this guy's on this guy's uh, behalf to uh, claim that the Frenchman had, uh, had uh, that his that the book, which is translated into English, ancient geography, uh, actually had the name Nehem or Nehem on it. Because I've now consulted an original copy of, of his two-volume work, was translated into English. It's not there. 
the map that shows Arabia is very general. Uh, it's a map of the world, and the, the name doesn't appear there. Um, the name, in fact, uh, appears on another map that he drew, which, is, which does not accompany his book. And uh, that there's no evidence that, that this was available anywhere. Nor the, uh, the there's a guy by the name of John Pratt who uh, who uh, organized a lending library in Manchester, New York, and it, the complete collection of his of his library has been published now, and uh, there's nothing in his library that connects remotely with anything that Joseph Smith could have had access to. So written sources, no, uh, I don't think so. No. There are pieces within the text which also fit, in my view, with, uh, with the context of Arabia. Let's start with one of the obvious ones, Lehi's dream. I believe the Lehi's dream is prophetic, not only for the house of Israel, not only for the coming of the Messiah, and so on, which we read in chapter 10, but also for other pieces of his, of his dream. I think that they're prophetic for his family in the next few years that they'd be traveling. Let me give you, for instance, okay, you know how, you know how this dream starts. Lehi is met by a guide wearing white, wearing white, white robe. He says, follow me, so I'll figure into the desert. Lehi says, we traveled for many hours, dark and dreary wilderness, it was dark, it was terrible all this sort of thing. He says, I finally prayed. And he said, then I found myself in a field, and the most prominent plant in this field, of course, is this lovely tree. Now, there's a difference between the field and the desert, okay? That's one, that's one point that we need to make. <clears throat> there were, in southern Arabia, waterworks. The Marab Dam had been erected a few decades before Lehi and Sarai passed through that area. The dam at Marib catches behind its, its, its walls the runoff of the Colorado River in a modern year. Now, to be sure, it's not like the Colorado River, which runs and runs and runs. We're talking about the runoff from up in the, up in the mountains behind through these valleys, and these valleys all funneled one, to, one toward another until they come to this one valley where these people built a dam across. 700 BC, they built this dam to catch the water. But the amount of water that comes rushing out of there after a rainstorm, big rainstorm up in the mountains, is the same as the Colorado River, same number of cubic feet per, per minute as the Colorado River in a moderate, in a moderate runoff year. Okay. So they backed up this water. They did so all over in, in this part of South Arabia. And then they would, they, they would leak it out in a series of sluices uh, where, they'd, where they'd actually remove, uh, remove uh, on, each, on each side, there was a cut <clears throat> which allowed them to dam it up. They would dam it up with, with, with wood and then they'd take pieces of wood out as the, as the water of the lake behind it dropped. And they would leak, they would let this water run out through these, through these ditches and water mile after mile of green land. <clears throat> well, they had to have it. They were servicing the camel trains that were coming up out of Arabia um, with, uh, <clears throat> with incense and so on, uh, packing all the stuff, and they have to have fodder as they go. So these people were servicing uh, both the camel trains and their own families and so on. So we know that there, there was greenery in this part of Arabia standing right next to the sand of the desert. That seems to be what we see in Lehi's, in Lehi's dream. This description of what he will see further south, all this irrigated land right in the middle of the desert. Another point. It looks like Lehi is doing what all people do when they travel through the desert in that part of the world. He goes at night. A person travels at night in order to escape the heat of the day. All of, the, all of the major deities of the civilizations in South Arabia worshipped the moon as the chief god. Okay, it was the moon god who was the chief god. Why? Because the moon god provides light at night when 
is traveling. <clears throat> Remember, there's this little thing in chapter 17 of Nephi. Where Nephi says, the Lord told, told me, I shall be your light. That's, it's a nighttime travel world. So Lehi's walking with his guide at night, as you do in the desert. Not as you do in Joseph Smith's upstate New York. Okay, this is not the way you do things. So Lehi arrives in the field, he finds the tree, and almost as though he expects to see somebody, he turns around and looks for Sariah. And the sons who are with her. Oh, there she is, along the stream. Come over. A running stream in South Arabia. It's coming probably out of a dam, all right? So he beckons her over, and she and the two younger sons come over, and they partake of the fruit. Then almost as though he's expecting it, he turns and looks for the older boys. Ah, they're Laman and Lemuel. Come on over here, and remember, they refused. But I'll suggest to you, this has been a trek through the night of a family. Lehi goes with the guy. Even though Sariah is behind him with the baggage animals and the two younger sons, and she may be behind him 70 or 80 or 90 yards, she can still see him, even if it's a moonless night, there's enough light from the stars that reflects off the floor of the desert, that she can still see his visage up there, walking ahead of her, so she knows exactly where she's going. She's coming with the two younger boys and, and the baggage animals. Behind them, if, one, if a family has the luxury of a couple of older children, the two older boys come as a, as a rear guard. Why does the, why is the father always out ahead? I've asked myself the question, that question. I've stood, at, as some of you have, I've stood on the bank of a canal in Egypt and walk, watched a family going along the canal bank opposite me. And here's the father out in front a few yards, uh, and here comes the woman with the two or three little kids who are holding onto her like Velcro. <clears throat> and. Uh, we as Westerners say, well, why doesn't he slow down and help her with the kids? And that's the wrong question to ask in their culture. The man is always out ahead looking for danger, for food, for water. Okay. Even though there's plenty of food and water over at home and home's only a quarter of a mile away in the next village, that's the way you do it. Okay. Um, so, I, th I think that this trip through the desert in Lehi's dream is a family trip. The grand, the grand demonstration of this is the, uh, is the order of the march of the, of the tribes of Israel, chronicled for us at the, at the opening of, of the Book of Numbers, where we see how the tribes traveled. The most important, the most precious part of the, uh, of the uh, caravan, this family caravan, is in the middle. Okay, it was that way for the ancient Israelites. That's where the movable temples put all the pieces, the, the, the rugs and, and, the, and the veil of the temple and all these sorts of things were all packed up and they're kept in the middle for protection. And that seems to be what we have, what we see in this, uh, in this trip. I think it's a trip of a family through the desert and it's a desert description. It's not a description that arises out of Joseph Smith's, Joseph Smith's world in upstate New York. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to do the next in, in, in just a couple minutes. You might remember that at the, uh, at the, there are indicators, I think, in the text about distance and time that, we, that, that, that are not directly mentioned, but we can sort of tease out of the text. Let me, let me try to give you one. We know that, that, the, that the party, this party of Lehi and Sarai, was in the desert for eight years. <clears throat> I'm not going to speculate where they spent all that time. Uh, I've, I've speculated an article was published in the Journal of Book Worm Studies. Uh, but one, one of the pieces that I think is important has to do with marriages. You might remember that just before Nephi narrates that his father received instructions from the Lord to go, they're in camp. Ishmael's family joined marriages. Everybody got married, okay? Five daughters of Ishmael, married the four sons of Lehi and Sariah, and Zorah. So all these marriages. Sometime soon after that, I think, the Lord says, Lehi. And he had to go. Okay. So they went off into the desert, 
and, um, and you suspect that within the first couple of months, all right, two of the brides maybe become pregnant. Maybe three, we don't know. At any rate, so they're going and, and some of the young brides are now pregnant and that's part of the challenge of this journey. That they're, they're, carrying, they're carrying babies and, uh, and, and it's tough. It's tough out there. So they go south, they reach Nahon. Ishmael, I, I'm guessing, has been in ill health for some time. That may be one of the reasons why they've stopped, is to allow him to recover his strength and so on, so they continue. So they finally reach Nahon, he dies. It seems as though the mourning is really intense, the way Nephi describes it. He describes it a bit like a man would describe it. They, they mourned exceedingly, he says. <clears throat> and, and it would have involved his own wife. And then, after the death and burial of, 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 of Ishmael, family crisis, Nephi mentions the first children. And I think that gives us a gauge. But they've gone that 11 or 1150 miles from the first camp to this place in South Arabia in a year or less that they've traveled that far. And I think it, I think it has to do with the new brides and somebody becoming pregnant and finally the birth of the children and all this sort of thing. And I, and I think that that's an indicator that, uh, that they've been on the trail that long. So then one has to account for the rest of the eight years, right? So that's that's for another that's for another time, but uh, but there is in the text I think this little set of details which give us a clue how far how long it took them to travel that more than a thousand miles. There is a there is a there is a, a gauge that's provided for us by Strabo, who is a geographer. Strabo wrote writes of a military expedition. By a, by a Roman force that came from Egypt into Arabia, marched south <clears throat> about the same distance from just a few miles, a few dozen miles south of where the family camped, about as far south as one would have to go before one, one has to turn east. And that, and that army, excuse me, that Roman army, made the trip in six months with a guide. <clears throat> they suffered terribly down there in, in Arabia uh, from all kinds of things, from bad water, bad food, all this sort of thing. Uh, the very same kind of thing that Benjamin mentions and others mention, disease and this kind of thing that this family suffered from. And so then they retraced their steps, the Romans did, with a fast march and it took them two months to go the distance that they'd come in six, uh, retreating back up through Arabia. But it gives us a gauge of about how long it takes to move people through this area. And I, and I think it's a reasonable thing. But the family took about a year from the first camp up in northwest Saudi Arabia to a place in southern Yemen where they then turned east. Okay. Um, there are hints about going through the mountains. There's a mountain chain that runs down the west side uh, of, of the country. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the, it seems as though they went through the mountains pretty early. One of the clues is, this, is the success which, this, which the sons enjoyed in hunting. Remember, as they traveled, they were hunting, and they, and they found success until finding Nephi broke his bow and the, and the other bows of his brothers uh, lost their spring. Um, but there seems to have been a lot of good success at first. And I suspect it's because they're in a place of cover, which the mountains, mountainous terrain would provide for them. They can actually sneak up on the ibex, okay, and, uh, and uh, knock it down with, a, with an arrow. So I've, uh, I think there are clues in the text that they move through the mountains uh, very early on in their, uh, in their journey. Um, 
Let, let me say, let, let me bring this to a close by saying a couple of words about Sariah. I think, I think perhaps other than the initial revelation to Lehi, we're going to start preaching, and then the next revelation to go, the most important spiritual event that occurred involved Sariah. Sariah, you remember, once there at the first camp, basically is saying, okay, what are we doing here? You know, why? Why we left our home? You know, why are we out here? And now you've sent our, she says to her husband, now you've sent our sons back to Jerusalem, 250 miles. Who knows what's going to happen to them between here and there? It's a terrible desert, terrible risks. Wild animals, uh, wild people, all this sort of thing. Why are we here? And you remember Lehi tries to calm her down. Uh, she, she even challenges his spiritual roots, spiritual roots of his knowledge. And he says, I know I'm a visionary man and so on. Then her son's finally returned. You, you know that she's probably out there every day, standing at a place where she has a long view somewhere so that she maybe can see them coming for three or four or five miles away. And she goes out to this place every day and looks. And she finally sees them. They arrive back in camp. Everybody's happy, rejoicing. Then Nephi says, he quotes his mother, one of the few places where you find a woman quoted in the in the book of Mormon, he quotes his mother and says, she said that she said, now I know. She, I believe that she had received a spiritual witness that the Lord had protected her sons. Then she says, now I know. She had received a spiritual witness that God was leading her husband. And that once she was on board, once she knew that everything was okay. Well, it wouldn't be okay. There are challenges. Because, because the woman is the one who has to go out there and try to make a salad out of, out of the stuff that's growing there. You know, thistles and those kinds of things. How are you going to do that? Okay. It's her challenge to try to keep the family alive. She's in, she's in charge of the furnishings and the tent and how people live and so on and survive. And with her on board, then she becomes the boss There's daughters-in-law and all this sort of thing, and they will survive because she knows. I think, I think it was, that was the grand key for their survival further in the desert, was Sariah receiving spiritual witness. And she, she bears it. Nephi quotes his mother as saying what she does. Okay, question. <clears throat> what about all this stuff? Does it prove the Book of Mormon true? No. Uh, does it prove the Book of Mormon false? No. Um, like Brother Woodward yesterday, nothing decisively proves it. But there are a number, number of circumstantial pieces that we can now fit into the, into the picture. And we can actually find ourselves with a clear picture now of what happened to this family and what their experience was. Uh, the way one learns whether the Book of is true is by reading it, going into the closet, and praying. And I know that way. I know that it's the Word of God. I know that it's a divine instrument. I know that this is a story that happened to real people. I'd like to leave that witness with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'd have to take questions. I think, as I recall, Carrie, yeah, people yeah, come to this little we'll take microphone about three, maybe four questions so that uh, yeah. so, so that uh, everyone can hear uh, the question and and uh, we can all enjoy this. Okay. Please. I have a question about the um, burial grounds that I've heard of, of around Nahum, and can you just address those and the issues associated with that? I've not actually visited this area, so I can't speak from personal experience. Ask me in a month, and I might be able to tell you. Um, the, from what I've read, uh, each, each major settlement uh, is accompanied by a burial ground. I don't know whether there's a major burial area for the Nehemiah tribe or not. It sounds, at least in the 6th century BC, as if there were. But, uh, but I don't know how many there are. I, I know burials in caves, I know burials underground where people actually uh, dig down through the earth. I know burial grounds that are associated with temples. I know burial grounds that are just on the edges of towns. I've read about these. Um, but, but uh, even, even if there were a number of burial grounds, 
uh, that apparently Ishmael was buried someplace. Part of, I think part of the problem of this was, I, I read this in a report of, um, archaeological report of, of work in Northwest Arabia. Uh, some guys discovered pottery pieces which indicated that, uh, that if a person died, while, while family members were out with animals sort of to the summer or winter range away from home, they actually packed that person's body in a bag or a, or a pottery jar and take it back home to bury it. It's like a secondary burial. And there are evidences of that in Northwest Arabia. And I'm guessing part of the, part of the mourning for Ishmael is we can't take him home to bury him. I think that's part of the, when they really have been ripped away from their beloved Jerusalem. And I think that's part of the, part of the deal. Yes. You were talking about uh, Lehi's dream, and one of the things that happens with Lehi's dream is apparently he seems to understand it pretty well. And what you're talking about, even though he doesn't understand the details, he would understand the process of the journey, so it would be familiar to him. Do you have any speculation as to why Nephi didn't understand the dream? That contrast between Lehi understanding what he saw and, Lehi, and Nephi saying, don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not certain. That of, the pieces, of the pieces that are preserved from Lehi, we don't have anything. Uh, we don't have anything as detailed about the Messiah as we see in uh, in Nephi's rehearsal of, of the vision. Um, and there may have been there may have been parts of that which Lehi didn't understand. We we just don't know. I don't know how thorough, how how comprehensive Nephi's account is of his father's dream. He gives it to us in two pieces. One of one of his uh, one of which is the family trip, and the other one is the Messiah and the, and the people of Israel and so on and their and, and their future. Um, the, it, it does seem as though Nephi did pick up a, an item or two that his father hadn't seen. Remember in chapter 15 when he's talking to his brothers, he talks about the stream of water, and then he talks about it being filthiness. I suspect it's a stream of water that's uh, coming out of a wadi. Uh, one of these canyons after a rainstorm, and the, and the water just carries everything, sand rocks, oh, pardon, uh, sand rocks, everything else uh, carries with it, vegetation, dead vegetation, and so on. And so it really is, it really is this tumbling, uh, turgid uh, water. Um, but uh, how, how much, how much, uh, it appears as though Lehi understands the whole thing. We don't know whether Nephi omitted some things his dad may not have may not have grasped. There certainly are parts of Nephi's dream where the, the angel will say, well, do you understand that? And Nephi said, no. And then the angel will explain to him, yeah. Uh, but how far to go down the road, I don't know. It's a good question. In New Jerusalem, there's the Israeli National Museum. In the museum, there's a reproduction of a cave which was discovered sort of halfway between Jerusalem and, and Elat. And the docent, when she finds out that your LDS tells you about Nephi's cave and that this is where he slept and had the dream, and she even shows you inscriptions that are supposed to be uh, some of the words from the introductory uh, chapters of the Book of Mormon. Is this just urban legend or are they just uh, entertaining the, the, the foreign Mormons or what do you think about this thing? Um, I, actually, I think quite little of it. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I, I think that there's, uh, there's no evidence that, that the brothers or anybody else ended up in this cave. Some of you, some of you are aware of this. We also published in one of these issues the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. Uh, Lamar Barrett's uh, uh, recounting of the evidence for this thing. It's a cave which is down um, near, near a place called Lakish. Some of you may know of the Lakish letters. Uh, because they're famous as an archaeological discovery. Uh, one has to go almost due west in order to reach this place before one turns south. And it's a long way out there. If you, if you ever drive this thing from Jerusalem down to Lakish, it's a long way to go. And it's a long way out of one's way. Uh, my, my preference is to think that, uh, that the family either went east 
and then south, went east up into the hills of Jordan, and then south, or they went south through Bethlehem, then Hebron, and then uh, down, down that way. Rather than going towards the Mediterranean Sea, a considerable number of miles, before they finally turned south, uh, down towards the, uh, the Red Sea. Um, the, the inscription, by the way, has been translated a couple of different ways, and, um, and I, I doubt seriously that, um, that, uh, that the so-called Lehi cave uh, was really where Lehi was. There, there, is, there is an attachment of the name Lehi to this place, but whether there's a memory that goes back more than 2,500 years uh, among these people, I think, is doubtful. That place has been swept off a couple of times. Romans and others came and chased people out. Um, swept off of, inhabitants were swept off. Okay, it looks like, uh, like we are there. Um, I do have some slides, but I think we're out of time to show them. So. <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have a chance and we'll, after the break, maybe we can. Okay. We, we can talk about it, we'll talk about it. And saying that I can show these slides and actually uh, throws here. So, let's just show the first slide. This, uh, this shows the map uh, uh, written by, uh, drawn by uh, uh, the German cartographer in about 1460. It's based on the work of uh, Ptolemy. There's a trail. There's, there's a trail, um, good idea, uh, there's a trail that comes down here as you can see just barely and you can see it poke out here and it comes all the way across over here and then, and then goes north. Uh, that may have been the medieval trail but it's, it's not the trail in Lehigh State. It does preserve this eastward turn that I talked about uh, but Joseph Smith would, have, would not have had access to this thing. Next please. <clears throat> Uh, I think that they went east out of Jerusalem. This is taken from the top of the Mount of Olives. You can see the north north end of the Dead Sea here. They'd have gone across here, up into the hills, and then south, perhaps following the King's Highway. There is no route that would go down the west side of the Dead Sea. At a couple of places, the, the mountain comes way too close to the edge of, of the, uh, the, actually, the, the mountain just comes right down to the shore. <clears throat> that is the shore, and it would have been impossible for pack animals to go. So they either went south out of Jerusalem, or they went east. Next, please. <clears throat> they've gone east, they might have, have, have gone south, and then, then east they would come down something like this. Uh, this is the, the Kidron Valley further down. This is the Marsava Monastery. Next, please. <clears throat> they, they reach the place where modern Aqaba is. They then come down here. The Hiltons believe that they were, that, that they camped here. The, um, the guys from Saudi Arabia have been poking around thinking it's a canyon right here on the coast that they reached. Next, please. <clears throat> they would go right past this. This is a view of Aqaba from a lot. I'm on the Israeli side photographing the Jordanian side. They would go right down here after they reached the, the tip of the Red Sea, which is just about a mile or two this way. They would have gone down here on their way to their first camp. Next, please. Um, this is the, the valley Wadi Taibalism. You can see it coming down. Uh, these guys who live and work in Saudi Arabia believe that this may be the place. You can see the palm trees that are growing because of the, because of the water table underneath there. Next, please. Um, here's, the, here's the canyon, or the Wadi Taiba. There's some, you can see these, these rock, rock pieces going up here. This is a four-wheel drive vehicle right here for scale. Uh, this is sunlight on the upper reaches of the, of the walls of the canyon, uh, the yellow part up there. Next, please. Uh, here's the stream that runs down that canyon. Next, please. And when it exits, this is what it looks like out on the coast. These are breakers right here along uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. And this is what it looks like when you come out of this place. Next, please. Uh, they'd have then continued wherever they camped in here. They'd have continued uh, this way after passing by Aqaba camping. Then they go further. Next, please. <clears throat> And they'd have reached a place um, down here in this area near Marib. Uh, and that's about the place where they turn east, heading for the coast over here. Uh, I'll tell you all those little yellow things are. Next, please. Um, 
This is what it looks like if they've gone into, if they've gone into the high tableland along the south edge of Arabia. It's impossible. It's cut with all these little rivulets and so on. They have to stay out of there. We also see the need for a liahona, right? Next, please. Uh, this is one of the things that caught my interest uh, in, in this exhibit of Yemen art. It looks to me like this is architecture. There's a tower, even though this is this is only about 25 inches high. Uh, that there's a tower. That there are windows, other recessed windows. There's an inscription at the top, and I thought, oh, great spacious building perched above the air. Um, and that was the thing that got me interested. Next, please. <clears throat> Here's, here's a, a number of these incense altars. They're all about 25 inches high. Most of them have the inscription from the donor. Next, please. And this is the one that I spotted. Uh, and uh, although we can't see it, it's around on the back side. The name Nehem is here. It's up on this upper panel. You can see here are the steps, the recessed doors, the windows, the overhanging, uh, the overhanging roof, and all that sort of thing, all characteristic of architecture in that part of the world. Next, please. Okay, here's, here's a mountain called Nehem, Jebel Nehem, uh, in that part of uh, Yemen. Next, please. So there's a mountain by that name. Then we finally come over to the coast of Oman. Uh, the the Astons believe that Wadi Saik is the place for the family camp. There's, there are a couple of guys in Saudi Arabia, uh, George Potter and uh, his friend Richard uh, uh, Wellington, who believe that it's uh, Kororori. Uh, these guys actually have a manuscript underway that they're hoping to publish the next year too. Uh, and, and one of the parts will be to feature Corvory as a possible place for Lehigh and Strike Camp. At any rate, it's this coastline, which is which in the summer becomes a Garden of Eden. Next please. <clears throat> you get to, you see the mountains that just rear out of the Indian Ocean uh, on the on the south coast of Arabia. This is along the Omani coast. Uh, they're all limestone, so these intrusions of iron ore are really unusual that our geologists found. Next, please. Uh, you can see what it looks like as you look back towards the desert. Uh, you need a Liahona to travel through this area. Next, please. <clears throat> there we found uh, remains of, uh, of structures. You can see them outlined here. Next, please, right along the coast. Uh, this is uh, Rebel Phillips who's looking for evidences of iron ore. Next, please. Um, he gets them on the end of his little magnet. He actually picked this up out of, uh, out of a dry riverbed. This is, uh, this is the thing that made Oman famous. This is a, uh, uh, the, the, the frankincense tree, and some of these just made some slits in here, and it bleeds out the frankincense, it hardens, hard and they, they cut it off and bag it, ship it. Next, please. <clears throat> this is uh, Terry Ball, our archaeobotanist. He was taking a photograph of a snake plant, which was in bloom in the dry season. Next, please. Um, I'm going to move us out here in this area, Jebel Samhan. Next, please. Uh, you can see these dikes that cut through through here. Uh, there could be gems in this part of the world. Next, please. Uh, and uh, once again, the dikes that cut through these uh, intrusions of rock. Next, please. Uh, when when Rebel, uh, Rebel Phillips, who's our geologist, found these pieces of hematite, he said to me, I've seen what I came to, to Oman to find. This is iron ore. Nephi could go over here a few yards and dig out 50 pounds. It'd take him an hour or two, but he could put them in saddlebags and take them someplace and make his tools. Next, please. Um, this is Kororori. It's the, it's the biggest of the inlets. There are about a dozen inlets along the southern coast of Oman, where the family could have settled, built their ship, floated it, and so on. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> this is the Canada. It's called Wadi Saik, where, uh, where the Astons believe this canyon goes back up here. There is, there is evidence of an ancient uh, lagoon. It was in here. It's now covered by, by a sandbar. Next, please. Um, you can see the sandbar. We're now looking to the east. And there, and there is evidence of uh, structure. Next, please. Um, we went out there by boat. Next, please. Um, this is David Johnson, our archaeologist, with uh, 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 Rosalie McIntyre, who's a longtime resident in Muscat. Next, please. Um, you can see here a water channel. Uh, so people have been building. Next, please. 
<clears throat> and here David's taking a side along the wall line. You can see the wall line right there. There's another one right there that comes to the corner and goes this way. So we know there are people living there, uh, probably in Roman times. Thanks, please. This is in Wadi Saik. Uh, Rosalie McIntyre, who, who's accompanied a lot of people to this part of, of Oman, knew that we were real professionals. When David, David Johnson found a bone tool in this very shallow cave, photographed it, and left it there. Other people whom she's taken there, you know, they find something right in their pocket, okay? But he knew that we were professionals, and David was a professional, when he photographed it and left it there. Next, please. <clears throat> we picked up this guy on the road down from the mountains down to the seashore where we got the boat to go out to the site. Uh, this is sort of the end of the story. He told us that he had been photographed by National Geographic. So I came home, found his photo. Uh, 1986, he was photographed by National Geographic. He was coming down to visit his second wife. His first wife lives up in the mountains in a village. His second wife lives in a village down at the seashore. It's allowed in Wilson Wall. Okay. At any rate, it was an interesting thing to run into a guy who had been photographed by National Geographic. Thanks. <laughs>